Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum tonight. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. We're really glad to have you here for the first of one of four great forums we're having this week as we kind of conclude our spring 2014 semester. We've got a good crowd tonight, and we're glad to have you all here. Um, tonight's forum on the Tea Party and Move On org is going to be moderated by Arkan Fung. Arkan's not a stranger to the forum. He's been here several times before. He's the Ford Foundation Professor of Democracy and Citizenship here at the Harvard Kennedy School and is affiliated with the Ash Center, uh, which without which we could not have put on tonight's forum. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Arkan. And what they've done ended up mobilizing millions of other Americans, Joan from the political left and Mark from the political right. Joan Blades grew up and went to college and law school in the Bay Area in California. She worked as a mediator before becoming a successful tech entrepreneur. Her uh, life in politics began, many of you will recall the days of the Clinton Lewinsky scandal in 1998. Um, angry that this issue was consuming all of the political oxygen in America, Joan and her husband applied some of their tech skills to political organizing. The couple posted a website with a one-sentence petition asking Congress to censure President Clinton and move on to other pressing issues. They sent it to 100 friends and family members, and within weeks the petition had grown to half a million signatures and inspired more than 250,000 uh, phone calls and one million emails to Congress. Joan has said that we never, anticipate move on, we never anticipated that move on would turn into a movement, and she calls herself an accidental activist, um, which is very understated because move on is an organization that today claims more than eight million members. Joan went on after that to found uh, co-found an organization called Moms Rising, an online off and offline community of over a, a million working moms, and you should check it out if you haven't checked out that organization yet. Uh, Ms. Magazine named Joan one of the women of the year in 2003, and she has uh, been called the mother of cyberspace mobilization and the Joan of Arc of high tech. <laughs> Mark Meckler grew up and attended college also uh, in California, in Southern California. Uh, over the course of his career, he's practiced internet law and has started uh, several businesses. He's kind of a serial entrepreneur. Uh, his political life, uh, and you should ask him more about this uh, later on, began shortly after the financial crisis and, and, of uh, 2008, and Mark and his family responded to what they regarded as the federal government's highly inept response. He and his family organized one of the first Tea Party events at the state capitol in Sacramento on February 27, 2009. He has told me personally, at, pretty low expectations of how many people would show up there. He says it was pretty exciting to have 150 people show up, but more exciting to me were the kind of people that showed up. They weren't people who'd come out before. They were all people like me who had never been politically active. That was one of 48 events all around the country in a short period that drew about 35,000 people who shared a belief in fiscal responsibility, free markets, and limited government. The Tea Party movement was born out of those early protests, eventually mobilizing tens of millions of Americans. Mark went on to serve as national coordinator for the Tea Party Patriots, which is uh, the largest Tea Party organization in the nation. And then in 2012, he founded a different organization called Citizens for Self-Governance, which is focused on uh, expanding and assisting a nonpartisan self-governance movement. It would be wrong, however, to think that Mark's main allies are powerful conservative politicians and his main adversaries are in the Democratic Party. He has said that politicians have used issues to divide us for decades, social issues, race issues, class issues. They've used partisanship 
to divide the people because when they divide the people, they maintain their own power, and that is one of um, Marx's passions. Maybe his driving political passion is addressing that problem. Despite their obvious political inclination, differences in their political inclinations, Joan and Mark have a remarkable list of things in common. Both are from California. Uh, both are serial entrepreneurs and started companies with uh, their spouses. Joan and her husband, I think many people in this room are too uh, young to remember this, but Joan and her husband founded Berkeley Systems, which is best known for the flying toasters screensaver that uh, many of us in an earlier internet generation uh, used and loved. Mark and his wife opened a cafe. Uh, neither was politically engaged until launching rather recent in political time, notable efforts to engage others in a very popular way. Both believe in the wisdom and power of individuals, both talk about serving their grassroots memberships, and both are inclined to bring people together rather than dividing them. Out of these commonalities, Mark, uh, I'm sorry, Joan co-founded the Living Room Conversations organization, and Mark is a uh, champion of that organization. Living Room Conversations is an effort to build respectful discourse across ideological, cultural, and party lines. Living Room Conversations is based on six basic rules of discourse, which maybe we could observe tonight. The first is be curious and open to learning. Second is show respect and suspend judgment. The third is look for common ground. The fourth is be authentic and welcome uh, that from others. The fifth is be purposeful and to the point, difficult in a university environment. <laughs> and sixth is own and guide the conversation. So maybe I'll start off with uh, a question about how you went from your uh, very different political orientations to trying to talk across some of these ideological and party lines. Um, both of you start with very, started organizations with very strong points of view, the Tea Party Patriots on one hand and move on on the left, uh, yet you are now working together trying to get people to talk about across those political lines. Joan, what happened? Was there a moment for you when you said that the ideological divisions and discourse has gone too far? And what got you to change? Actually, that was six months into the impeachment scandal. <laughs> that we were going, wait a minute, we've obsessed with the scandal when in theory our government and media had other things that might be important to report upon. And so the one sentence petition to censure the president and move <clears throat> on to pressing issues facing the nation was actually a petition that gathered thousands and thousands of Republican signatures mm -hmm. as well as Democrats, Independents, Green Party, you could love Bill Clinton or really dislike Bill Clinton and still find that petition to censure and move on. So it, was, it started with a very unifying statement and I believe that was one of the reasons it spread in what mm. we describe as a viral ma manner. And that's when I started learning about politics. Interesting. And it was only after the election where we got lots of people out to vote for the first time and engage for the first time and two weeks later, there was a vote to impeach when impeachment was unpopular and good citizenship is participating and then trying to get people elected that reflect your values. And as soon as you get involved in elections, that is an adversarial process. So that's kind of the way it got to. So from the very beginning, even though, so your motivations for move on maybe differ a little bit from what Move On became later on, at least at the outset. We know I'm a mediator by origin and inclination, and mediation is about empowering people to make their own decisions. Yeah. And so listening to the Move On members and helping them be more effective feels very right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where I really find the most excitement is you know, finding common ground in places to work together. And Mark, for you, was there a moment sometime, you know, after the, the initial protests in 2009 and the rise, this meteoric rise of the Tea Party when you said, wait a minute, there's something missing here? You know, I think like Joan, I've always had that inclination. I live in a fairly unique place up in the Sierras in Northern California. Two cities side by side, two small towns, Grass Valley and Nevada City. And Nevada City is literally like an old hippie town and Grass Valley is an old mining and ranching town. And so you've got this very diverse uh, ideological population mixing together. Our cafe you mentioned in Nevada City is this very uh, 
sort of counterculture bohemian cafe and you got a redneck like me running the place. <laughs> and so that was just kind of my environment. So for me, there was never a partisan hatred because the people who came in my cafe were you know, kids with mohawks and facial piercings and the artists in town. And we had art shows and poetry readings, right? So that was part of my culture. But I also love the ranchers and the miners and the construction workers. So for me, the idea that people have to hate each other over politics or that because somebody believes something different from you politically, they're bad, I just never bought into that. And then when I started to go to Washington, D.C. for the first time, I saw that there was an entire political industry built around that hatred. I, you know, it's the profitable politics of hate, I call it. I saw it in D.C. and I saw it in the media. You know, when I would go be on television, what they want more than anything on television is for you to, you know, the veins to pop out and you to yell at the person across the table from you. From their perspective, that's good TV. I don't think it's good citizenship. That's really, that's really interesting. So um, this kind of goes, follows up a little bit, the next question on uh, the kind of Washington industry of uh, politics. And one thing that both of you had very, very strong reactions to recent political events, the Clinton Lewinsky scandal, government response to the financial crisis and the economic meltdown. Um, when many Americans get upset or uh, have political interests, they go to kind of more regular channels. They will call their politicians, maybe say something to the political part, maybe go to media. Each of you took a very different route. You went in very different ways straight to the people, bypassing the ordinary political channels and mechanisms and organizations. And we're the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, much of what we do is oriented to train people to be in those organizations that you chose to short circuit, right? So why go straight to the people? And Mark, uh, when we've talked and in some of your writings, uh, you say that you said that um, you're really passionate about the question of who decides. And right now you feel like they decide. You'd like it more if over more decisions we decided. What might that look like? And why did you short circuit the main organization? It seems to me, looking at our political system today, there's an underlying premise, uh, whatever, whatever subject we're debating at the national level, and the premise is that it should be a national level debate. And I think that's very disrespectful of the American people because we have the, the great strength of America is its diversity. We have an incredible diversity at the individual level, at the community level, at the state level. And that means that, generally speaking, one size fits all is not ever going to be the best solution. I think people should decide for themselves in their own localities. The best example I can give you of how this works is, is right at home, in, in my own backyard. I live rurally in Northern California, as I said, because you want to know what this looks like. And my neighbor has a vineyard, and I love the view of the vineyard. It's beautiful. I sit out on my deck at night sipping wine and looking at his vineyard and enjoying <laughs> his labors. And one day, I got a notice in the mail that said he was going to do on sale alcoholic beverage sales. I was really unhappy. I thought, you know, it's my quiet neighborhood and he's going to ruin the neighborhood. And I really didn't like it. And there was a hearing. And so I opposed his permit. And I went to the hearing and I presented my case and he presented his case. And ultimately, he won. And shortly after he won, we had a Blackberry festival at our place we do every year. We jam stuff and we've got all these Blackberry bushes. And I invited he and his wife over to the house. And he was really surprised that I invited him over. And I invited him because I had no hard feelings because he was my neighbor and we had resolved this thing locally. I had my day in court, so to speak. It wasn't court, but we had a hearing and he won fair and square. And in the end, he's my neighbor. If that decision had been made in Washington, D.C. or Sacramento, I'd have been very unhappy about it. And I'd always felt that it was unjust. And either way it went, he would have felt it was unjust or I would have. But because we participated, it was participatory governance, he won fair and square. By the way, he was right. <laughs> it's, it's been no problem at all. But it was just about this feeling of actually participating at the local level, the decisions made there. We both get input and when we walk away, we can shake hands and be neighbors. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a fundamental premise of how good governance should work, how citizen involvement should be. That's great. Joan, what about you? Why did you feel like you needed to go directly to the people in the form of a petition rather than through some more conventional political method or organization? I actually can't think of any conventional organization that was dealing with that in an effective way. Mm -hmm. In fact, 
one of the things we've described is we stepped into a vacuum of leadership at that time. Who is saying something sensible? Censure and move on, get back. It was actually a business person's plea for you know, their opportunity cost to being focused. And as a mediator, I saw the com country becoming increasingly polarized. And yeah, I think we do have a, a need to make it possible for people to engage in politics in a way that is meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. And that's at local, state, and national levels. Right. And the more we can do that in an effective way, the better, because right now, I am very concerned that corporate voices are much more effective mm -hmm. than citizen voices. Very good. So let's move on to some of those issues. So a lot of people, maybe a bunch of people in this audience might say living room conversations, it's a good idea, the principle of discourse, that's fine. But on the really important issues, left and right, we just disagree, and we're just going to have to agree to disagree and fight it out, right? That's what a lot of people say. Are there, what kinds of issues have you guys found surprising agreement on, you know, on the, the big issues that, that divide left and right, which I think are just about all of them now if you look at Congress, right? You know, I think, uh, first of all, your, your initial premise, I think, is correct. There are issues where we just have to agree to disagree, and we'll go back to our corners and lace up the gloves and fight it out. That's what our political system is set up for. But there are a lot of other issues where that's not the case. So I think uh, one of the fundamental ones Joan and I found early on is the idea of crony capitalism. This intersection of big business and big government is not healthy for the citizenry of this country, except for maybe those that are personally benefiting financially from it. And you can sit down in a room of people as partisan as you want, and when you talk about crony capitalism, there's very little daylight between their positions. And so DC is not going to address that because that's a very profitable situation for them. We think it's broken, they think it works perfectly. So it's gonna be up to people like Joan and I and everybody here and all the citizens to figure out how to address those kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. And Joan? Well, that was the first time I met Mark is I invited him to my house to have a conversation about crony capitalism with two of his friends. Living room conversation structures two friends, each invite two friends. So it's a very small, intimate conversation. And I admit, I was dusting for a week ahead of time to make sure, <laughs> you know, I was anxious. <laughs> no. I brought baked goods, I was very harmless. And Jams. <laughs> really good coffee cake. Mark's wife makes great coffee cake. So, but what we discovered when we sat down together much to my you know, relief, was I really liked Mark, and I really liked his friends. And when we talked about these issues of crony capitalism, we found there was a huge amount of agreement on the issues of criminal justice. You know, too many people in prison, war on drugs is a failure, we gotta use evidence-based practices for dealing with people that are in the criminal justice. And as a, in the last year, I've been investigating that, and it's true. And it goes, you know, I can't find much dispute about that. And yet we have a prison industrial complex coupled with prison guard unions that are causing nothing to change. And so my question is, now that I've discovered this, can we as, you know, citizens on left and right together make that change happen? And I haven't got the answer yet, but I think it's time to really dig in and see what we can do together. Mm -hmm. But that's I, just and one. I agree, that's a fundamental area of agreement. You know, you can, it doesn't matter who, who you're talking to, if you sit in front of any audience, and I practice this, you know, I speak in front of progressive and liberal audiences and conservative audiences, I always ask the question, who in the room thinks we have the best criminal justice system in the world, and the war on drugs is a tremendous success. So you guys go ahead and raise your hand. <laughs> so no matter where I go, you know, you guys might be tea partiers because it's the same in a tea party room. So if that's the case, if we as citizens, the great majority of us, by the way, I haven't found one person who raises their hand and says it's all good. So if we all feel that way, then why do we have the status quo and why have we had it for so long? Because somebody's profiting from that because the system as set up is working for somebody, just not the average citizen. Mm -hmm. That's really good. And then, um, so why does the discourse divide us. I mean, you guys have 
all, all you had to do, evidently, was uh, invite Mark over, and all Mark had to do was bring some baked goods and some coffee, and you find some common ground. Um, I know lots of activists on the left and the right, uh, more, I know personally, maybe because I'm in Cambridge, more on the left uh, than the right, and uh, again, many of them are in the audience tonight, they don't have those kinds of conversations. So what are some of the, what's your diagnosis of that? What are some of the, the habits that we're engaged in that prevent us from finding common ground on issues like the failures of mass incarceration in the United States or crony capitalism? What are some of the dysfunctional things that all of us do? Well, we've got some deeply dysfunctional practices, both in the media and with our politicians. Mark's talking about how in DC, right now you get further if you are spouting in a very adversarial story. And the concept that we are gonna get where we need to go by adversarial problem solving is just simply wrong. And the reality is we need to start working together collaboratively because the nature of our outcomes is so substandard when it's an adversarial solution. You know, witness how we've done such a good job with budgeting. And even with healthcare, it could be so much better if we were collaborating. Um, you can hope, I believe, that working with people that have different viewpoints than I do, that don't agree, will have a better solution, ultimately, by really listening to each other then we'll do really well. But as long as it's set up as a fight, we're gonna have solutions that are so far less effective than what we need that it's gonna undermine us. Mm -hmm. Well, and those habits are modeled for us. I mean, if you turn on the TV, depending on which side of the media you consume, you see people calling people on the other side names and challenging their intelligence and challenging their integrity. And that's just the standard operating procedure. So you see politicians doing this to each other. You see media figures doing this to each other. So our society from the top down is modeling this behavior for us. So it's, you know, I think it's natural that people, they come at it that way. So they sit down with somebody and it's immediate confrontation. And so part of it is just breaking that habit and realizing the person sitting across from you is a person. Most likely they're a person of good faith and so that you can have a good faith discussion with somebody. And part of that, I think, is watching our own language and being careful about how we say things and not being inflammatory. Because we watch all this media and consume all this politics, I think we have a tendency to just regurgitate what we hear, not realizing that it's inflammatory to somebody who holds a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And so who's responsible? So there's a couple of different views about this, right? Some people will blame Congress and politicians and say that it's the leadership that is polarizing with the rhetoric and uh, it's in the advantage of particular politicians to draw people into corners, right? But then a bunch of the public opinion research shows that America is polarized as well, that it's not them, it is us and we're in our different corners, right? Uh, and that public opinion itself is responsible and it's public opinion actually that's making Congress more polarized because we're voting for more extreme folks, right? So whose fault is it? Is it them or is it us? We're all responsible. Yeah, that, we can't divide that up. And it's really, you know, the living room conversations are one opportunity to try and do it differently. But I really have to be listening to Mark. I've learned so much doing conversations with Mark and others that have very different viewpoints than I do. After our conversation about crony capitalism, I realized we're having pitched battles all around this country on the issue of fracking. And they're based on power and money. And I could not sit down and have a living room conversation with Mark and his friends because if I believed what Mark believes, I'd think it was great. I now understand what he believes. Right. And if he believed what I believe, he'd think it's a disaster. And we have, I'm not an expert on fracking, I'm trusting my trusted expert. So we're living in these parallel narratives and that's deadly for democracy. So the place where I have the greatest 
belief and trust is in citizens because when I meet them, they're caring, they're smart, they can do great things. And it's living room conversations, it's very granular. It's, mm -hmm. But once we have that relationship, I hear him and his friends in a completely different way. And I, I want all of us to feel like we're moving forward in a way that's going to be satisfactory. So um, I want to put a, a hard question to you. Obviously, both of you have very different politics, right? And imagine that we got to the place where both of you want to get in America, where I certainly want to get in America, where uh, the policy choices and laws uh, are more reflective of what people want and advance their interests more than they currently do. And we get there through a big living room conversation, right? But both of you can't be right about your politics, right? So Joan, maybe you think Americans would opt for progressive policies on wealth distribution, health care, and the environment and treatment of women. Mark, maybe you think people would choose less federal government, maybe more local and some state government, fewer regulations on uh, the environment and social life, a freer market. You can't both be right, right? Americans are going to go one way or another. So where do you stand at the end of the day, at the end of that big living room conversation? What if America chooses a set of policies and laws that is just one that is not yours, one that you're really opposed to on health care, on the environment, on regulation? I'm good with that. I trust the, <laughs> no, really, I trust the American people, honestly, as a, as a whole, more than I trust myself. The American people are smarter than any individual. And like the American people created this country. In every crisis, the American people themselves have risen up and rescued the country and rescued liberty and freedom. And so I trust them. And I may not like the result. I'm not saying I'll like it. I said I'm good with it. And that's a different thing. I didn't like the fact that my neighbor got that permit for on sale alcohol sales or on, on site alcohol sales. But I trusted the process because I was engaged. I saw that it was transparent and fair. And in the end, whatever happens, happens. So I trust the American people if the process is in their control and transparent. And I'm hoping for a process that is better, that is open-hearted. That you know, Parker Palmer has a beautiful way of talking about living with the tension of our differences and being able to come up with solutions that are better than my solutions and better than Mark's. Because if we are able to sit with that tension of disagreement and not being what we, having what we aspire to and work together to come up with solutions that satisfy our basic needs, I, I like to believe that we will get to a place that I will be satisfied. You know, and I want to add, I think there's something unique at least for me in, in my discussions with Joan that's very different than other uh, efforts at cross-partisanship or non-partisanship, whatever you want to call it, is that neither of us have, have ever spent time on the word or thinking about the concept of compromising. And this is something I really mm -hmm. admire about Joan. We're not looking for some middle way that neither of us likes. What we're looking for is common ground, a place where we can both plant our flag and say, you know what, we both believe in that, and we're both good with that. So I think that's a unique approach. The idea of compromise for me, not, not always, I mean, there's room for compromise, but people who just say, oh, we should just find the middle ground. Well, that doesn't mean it's the best ground. What we're looking for is a place where we can both plant the flag and agree this is the best ground we can mm -hmm. get to. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. So uh, last question, and then we'll open it up, and people should uh, start thinking about questions and lining up to the microphone. So the last question is, you know, you could either draw from the great work that you're doing right now in your different organizations or look beyond that. But if you could kind of wave a wand, what is the one thing that would improve the quality of political conversation in America right now? Mark. And for me, and you mentioned this early on in my introduction, it's a question. And I think the fundamental question facing Americans today is who decides? Much more than what should we do? The question is, where are those decisions made? Where do people believe that decisions should be made? And for me, I believe that everybody in here should make the decisions, that people at home, individuals, families, communities, to the extent that we can. I 
subsidiarity, the Catholic Church would call it, that you make decisions as locally as you possibly can and you'll get the best decisions. And that's the who decides narrative. And I think that's the most important question that we can ask in America. And if we always get asked that question, and if we get it right more often than not, we'll get better decisions than just fighting about what should we do. And the interesting thing is, my first response to that is listening. If we really start listening to each other, I think things would change in some profound ways. And that's the open-hearted listening. Because you know, if I'm just trying to figure out, and it's very tempting to do that when I'm up on stage, what I'm going to say next and how I'm going to make my point while Mark's talking, I don't hear him. And then I don't come up with something that's better and going to satisfy us all. So really listening. Well, I guess the, uh, the uh, hopeful part of the conversation, the, the depressing part of the conversation is that we're very far from that kind of political process. And I read a, a public opinion poll recently that um, Congress is actually less popular than cockroaches and having an open wound, <laughs> right? But the hopeful part of that conversation is there's a lot of room to create, and so that's, that's what you guys are doing, which is fantastic. All right, so uh, I, I was told, right, the, the forum uh, questions, it's important to emphasize that uh, when you ask a question, please identify yourself. One question per customer, so uh, keep it concise. And then a question always ends with a question mark, so keep that in mind. <laughs> Yeah, so please identify yourself. Thank you so much for being here. Both of you being here actually gives me a lot of hope. Um, my name is Dev Zaveri. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Um, I'm also from California, like the two of you, and <laughs> I at least have found some hope in the Citizens Redistricting Commission, where the citizens set the boundaries for state and federal office. I'm wondering if I'm being naive or if that is a ray of hope uh, in the future. Thank you. So do you guys know about the Citizens Yeah. yeah. I think it's a start. I mean, it does give me hope. I'd rather have citizens in charge of the process than politicians. Although, interestingly, if you study... Uh, so maybe I, so the Citizens Redistricting Commission, for people who aren't in California, redrawing districting lines is a big problem in the United States because oftentimes they're drawn by sitting politicians and whether they're Democrats or Republicans, right, their main interest is in drawing lines that keep them in office, which is not the same as our interest in voters. And California recently uh, uh, created a citizens redistricting commission in which anyone could apply, and 30,000 people applied, including a student in my ethics class from the Kennedy School. He didn't get in. Um, but then uh, the commission was empaneled, and they developed a, a set of maps for what the districts looked like in California over a very long period. Right? These are ordinary citizens. Any one of you could apply. You don't have to be a mathematician or a political scientist. And the maps that they drew got very, very good reviews from all of the good government groups, like League of Women Voters, et cetera. But so the, the main idea is shifting the power over drawing lines, district lines on a map from sitting politicians to ordinary citizens. That's what yeah, the Yeah, and we had about 26% of our congressional seats, uh, and our all seats changed hands in the last election, where prior to that only one had in 10 years. <laughs> right. um, so, I mean, to me, that keeps perfectly with my theme of who decides. So, in that case, we said the citizens should decide, and it worked out better. So, I, I think it does give you hope, and it gives a model for more things that should be turned over to the citizens. Good. Uh, next question, gentlemen. I want to thank all three of you for bringing this sanity <laughs> into the room and modeling it, and the Ash Center for organizing it. Um, and I want to see this happening with the people in Congress. So I was wondering, have you tried, have you given thought to, can we look forward to hearing that you will each bring two Congress people friends and two uh, Congress people friends with both of you in the room to model it and you know, to do it? It might be a stretch to That's say that idea. I have friends in Congress. <laughs> friends of friends of friends, what do we call it? Yeah. Six degrees yeah. of separation, right? I won't accept that as a limitation. Um, because they need it. And no matter how many of us begin to participate in these kinds of conversations, we're still left waiting when we leave the room today to see it happening where the decisions need to be made, where the gridlock is, where the dysfunction is really causing us a lot of pain and danger. That's a great idea. 
I would love to do that. Um, I think we're known as outsiders, which yeah. <laughs> makes... <laughs> the doors don't fly open when I walk down the halls of Congress. It's not that we couldn't get those people here, but I would, I would say I'm not really focused on them. I mean, I've seen too much turnover in Congress and nothing changes. I don't think we're going to change them until we change the structure. I think the incentives are wrong. The whole system is set up to incentivize this kind of behavior. So until we, in my opinion, until we take some of the power away from them and change the incentive structure, having them talk to each other. You know, remember polling shows right now, 80% of Americans think that Washington DC is dysfunctional and 80% of people employed in DC think DC is functioning perfectly. So that's Yeah, the but in their heart of hearts, and oh, part Lord, of what happens here is you do get to see each other's heart of hearts by listening. There are people serving there who are very idealistic, who are very frustrated, and feel trapped by that system. Yeah, I but know. I'm supposed to end with a question, so there we go. <laughs> Good. Uh, up here, Ben. Uh, hi, my name is Ben Bolger, and I'm a Harvard alum. Um, there's a number of examples where when people get together and have quality conversations, better decisions are reached. The Iowa caucuses, um, in jury rooms where folks discuss things, 12 Angry Men is a great illustration of that. Um, in the information age, uh, both of your organizations have organized incredible websites, and certainly the quantity of dialogue has increased. But I'm wondering if you could reflect a little more on the quality of dialogue that leads to more deliberative type of decisions. Is there a way to facilitate bringing people together to have those kind of experiences that might happen in a jury room or in a caucus where people can work together to produce a better outcome through technology? Right. That's not well, in a living room, right? That's yeah. the technology question. Well, the Living Room Conversations are an open source project. So we've got this concept. We've put our best practices up there, and people are already messing around with it. And my feeling at this point is we really do need that in-person connection. You know, that the small, intimate, breaking bread together has a lot of value. Yeah. On the other hand, yeah, there are a lot of people very anxious about having a conversation with someone with a different viewpoint because they've seen such negative behaviors modeled. I have a friend that said, yeah, I really want to do this. And he really did. And then he started thinking about it. But I wouldn't want to do it with my neighbor because what if it didn't go well? And well, I shouldn't do it with my colleagues. And so it became an obstacle. Well, it turns out another friend said, you know, I have Facebook friends. And she got together with high school friends, a Tea Party leader, in fact, because I'm, I live in Berkeley, not just the Bay Area. Not a lot um, of Tea Party leaders there. <laughs> not a lot. Um, and they had a wonderful conversation, and it was with you know, the class from before. So there, there are ways that I think the technology complements the in-person, but I think with this, the degree of discomfort we have today, and we're talking the early adopters right now, I'm thinking it probably needs to be in person. But I'm happy to have someone show me that, and ah, now we can do it like this too, and it'll be awesome. Mm. Uh, I would agree with Joan. You know, the inherent anonymity of the internet causes people to behave poorly. <laughs> and so one of the things that made the Tea Party so successful that really hasn't been written about much is, uh, I, I always refer to the Tea Party as social networking 2.0, and it went backwards. In other words, we got together online first, and all of us started to find each other online <laughs> What made the Tea Party work was, then we all got together in our communities, we met each other, we made tons of friends and built permanent relationships, and it's that web of personal connection that really makes the, I think gives the citizens power. Hi, my name is Max, I'm a freshman at the college. I wanna ask a question about what you were saying earlier about crony capitalism. Sure. And Mr. Meckler, I think I'm quoting you here. You said that you trust the American people if the process is in their control. But there are obviously a lot of institutional problems uh, that m essentially make it so that the process is not in their control or not nearly as much as it should be and as it has been in the past. Uh, and in particular, that relates to issues relating to you know, campaign finance that either directly or incorrect indirectly more or less lead to some forms of corruption. And those forms of corruption ultimately end up in activist institutions like your own on both the left and the right. The Koch brothers are major, major funders, for example, of the Tea Party, as well as of the Republican Party. So I, I don't personally see how that, these kind of major institutional challenges can be solved by something like living room conversations. So my question would be, what do you see as the strategy, as an actual strategy, to remove what 
economists might refer to as rent-seeking, out of politics, uh, so that there is, in fact, a more equitable distribution of voices or of power among the American people. So a couple of uh, underlying premises, I have to address a couple of inaccuracies. You say the Kochs are major funders of the Tea Party. Well, as a guy who founded and led the largest national Tea Party organization in the nation, 3,200 chapters, 23 million members, we never saw a dime of Koch money. It was a grassroots organization. To be fair, Koch is a funder of Americans for Prosperity, which you know, most Tea Partiers felt it's not a grassroots Tea Party organization. It was part of the establishment. It's based in Washington, D.C. So I just wanted to correct that underlying premise. I agree with you about the structural impediments. And that's really specifically what Joan and I are working on. For me, personally, I think the way you fix the structural impediments is through an Article 5 amending convention for proposing amendments to the Constitution. I think this is really important, that people need to speak on the structure of governance. The founders understood that the Constitution wasn't always going to be perfect. They didn't think it was perfect when they did it, and they said that the people who came after needed a way to speak to the structure again at some point in history. I think we're at that point in history that we need to speak to the structure of governance. So I think that's a fundamental reform that needs to take place. There are people on the left who, who feel the same way for different reasons. You know, Larry Lessig at Harvard Law believes in an Article 5, and I just met with Larry before this. I'm a big fan of Article 5 for totally different reasons, by the way. Him, campaign finance, and me, size and scope of governance. That's very good. Um, my name is Tyler Creighton. I, uh, I work at Common Cause Massachusetts here in Boston. And my question actually was also related to campaign finance. Uh, my organization works on that. And, um, you know, I see the, the mutual consensus around crony capitalism, and for me, it always comes back to campaign finance. And I guess I always thought or figured there'd be more consensus on that as being a solution. And so I was, this is mainly directed at Mark um, on do you think that's a solution? And if not, why? No, is my short answer. And the reason why is because money has always played a role in politics. You can try to drive it out of view and then it will just go underground and play a role in politics. And I also don't think it gets at the root causes. I do believe it plays a role, and Larry and I talk about this a lot, Larry Lessig and I. I think it plays a role, definitely. But uh, the real issue is why do people spend so much money on politics? Why is it that corporations try to influence politics? Why is it that these big interest groups try to influence politics? There's a very rational reason. You know, I, I believe in the rational uh, <laughs> actor theory, right, of, of society. And the reason is, Government has such immense influence over every aspect of our lives. So much money can be moved with the stroke of a pen that is a rational investment for business people to invest in influencing the system. And I believe if we shrink the system down and we remove the influence of government over business and society in general, there's a lot less rational incentive to make big financial investments in the process. So there's actually a piece of political science that uh, argues that uh, companies and interest groups underinvest in influencing the political process because the return on their investment, they should be more corrupt because they get much more back. It's the, it's the greatest Grant return on investment of anything that a company can do. If you can afford to invest in lobbying, your return on investment is generally greater than any other investment a company could make. So I think that's what's broken is if government didn't have all that influence, it wouldn't be worth investing that money. The Conversations Project, I see, I have to put it in my mouth. <laughs> um, uh, the Public Conversations Project, and I've been looking forward to this. I've heard about your road show for some time, and being in the presence of what to me is one of the most hopeful things going on out there, I've been reminded of another one that I'm involved with, which, which is another source of great hope to me, which is no labels. I don't think right. many people here know that right now there are about 90 members of Congress who have become active in something called the Problem Solvers uh, Outgrowth of No Labels. They're meeting together frequently, informally. They've already filed some bipartisan legislation and they're working on a, a strategy statement for the whole country. Now what I'm thinking as I listen to you is what if living room conversations were um, held strategically in the districts of those people who've stepped out of the polarization as, as usual, who've taken a risk in becoming involved? What if there was some way 
to spread the model of what you're doing and your resources uh, into their district. I mean, I think there is a way of the micro and the macro um, coming together, and I wonder what you thought of that idea. Well, fundamentally, with living room conversations, they're structured to be completely accessible so that if there is an organization or an individual that wants to use them to talk about any given issue, they can have you know, as many conversations. The dream is to have hundreds of conversations about different issues and create this grassroots support for good leaders. So this would be right. one of the ideal outcomes. I mean, living room conversations are basically a startup still. They're still in that really very mm -hmm. early stage, and that's why it's really wonderful to be invited here. And um, we are hoping very much that this kind of thing inspires people to do conversations and then to feed back to the living room conversations of what worked and so that we can help others replicate it. And we have a virtuous cycle of offline, online conversations. You know, the virtuous cycle is a really important concept. One of the things that I'm privileged to do because I know Joan and like Joan and have met lots of other people who consider themselves progressives, liberals, Democrats, how, whatever label you want to apply, is that I get to go back to people on the right and when they say things like, all Democrats X, I can say, you have no idea what you're talking about. That's crazy, <laughs> you know? There are people like you, there's a diversity of opinion, you can't lump people into a single monolithic group and vice versa. So I go speak at progressive organizations and I can say, look, this is what the right looks like. It's, you know, I took my hat off so you guys could see I don't have horns, right? The Tea Party is <laughs> not scary. We're just regular people. And so what I want people to understand is on both sides, that's true. And it's really important that all of us individually take the responsibility to spread that, the idea that these are your fellow citizens, these are your neighbors, your coworkers, employers, employees, fellow churchgoers, whatever, they're not your enemies. That is the underlying premise of all of this. We have to start from that place. Up here. Is this on? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Neither Move On nor the Tea Party have uh, really issued any definitive platforms on foreign policy, but there have been some hints dropped, which leads me to wonder if, about the intriguing possibility, if it can come together, of a non-intervention uh, coalition of the left and the right that could uh, finally put an end to the uh, bipartisan imperial aggression of Republicans and Democrats. Want to take that on? Do you have well, for move policy? on. Move on is now, you know, fully member petition driven. So move on is just helping members send a petition to move on members, and that which is moving, we send to others. So, that, you know, nobody, there's no one in charge at Move On that says, <laughs> this is what we're working on this week. It's our members it really that say, is. this is what we're working on this week. Uh, so if that becomes something that is a priority for Move On members, if you wrote that petition and it worked, then that's what would happen. And, I, you know, the Tea Party's the same. And this is something that I think people really struggle with because it doesn't fit the paradigm, right? The model is that there's a person in an office sitting behind a big desk and maybe they sit in the conference room and there's six or seven people that all decide, okay, what do we do now? And what's the direction now? The Tea Party movement has never worked like that. It's citizens and it's done by consensus. And you know, I had people come to me when I was still national coordinator at Tea Party Patriots and they'd have an idea and they'd call me up or write me an email and say, you need to do this one thing because that's the only thing that will save the nation. And if you don't do this, then you're wasting all your efforts. And, and I would always give the same response. I would say every idea starts with a single patriot. It's up to you to spread that idea in the grassroots. And if we see it bubble up, like she's talking about with Move On, then we might take it on. But it's got to come up from the citizens, not down from somebody who's in charge. And I mean, it's really remarkable what you just said, right? Because you could think, well, these consensus organizations where it's totally flat, that's all right. But they'll be small. Right, but the interesting thing is your organizations are not small. They're some of the biggest organizations on the political scene right now. And you know, some people who've looked at this say it's because it's so flat and it's not a guy in an office developing a strategy and telling everybody else what to do. 
It's that you know, people like it. They got big because they feel like they have some ownership. And it's not one guy calling the shots and everybody else falling in line. It's just interesting to note that what you say is, is a source of growth, not no, a smallness. I think smallness. you nailed it. So look, people want to feel like they have some say in things. And they don't, uh, it's the funniest thing. I get political consultants or politicians telling me all the time, oh, you need to get the Tea Party to do X. You need them to support this or that or that person or this policy. And I just laugh because if somebody says that, they just have no clue what's they just going don't get on. It. No, they don't get it at all. It's really hard to explain it to them. They'll glaze over and they're like, yeah, yeah, I know. But if you would just tell them to do X, that's a good way to get hung, by the way. If you try and tell the Tea Party they have to do something. <laughs> I assume move on membership is the same. If somebody said, you know, okay, now we're going to make all of you guys do this, there'd just be a rebellion. Well, nobody would do anything. Exactly. I mean, that's, I mean it really they would laugh is at remarkable. Us. Yeah. Is about, yeah. it's another kind of right. listening, right? Our job at Move On is to serve our members. And the better we listen, and that is something that's a priority for the whole Move On staff, is to listen well and help our members be as effective as they can be. Yes, really interesting structurally. So, uh, you know, I now run Citizens for Self-Governance. We're a grassroots organization. And I look at almost all the emails that come in. I can't read them all, but I try because I'm listening. Because if I don't do that, if I step back and I don't listen to those and I don't respond to those, then I don't really know what's going on. And then it becomes me, a guy behind the desk making the decisions. You have to be, have your ear to the ground. And I don't think the politicians really do anymore. That's part of the problem. My name is Richa Mishra, and I'm a research fellow at the Ash Center. Thank you both for being here, and thank you for this conversation. Uh, we've been talking a lot about how public dialogue has become very confrontational and ultimately not very productive. And uh, the loudest voices are uh, very often using divisive rhetoric to pursue very narrow interests. So living room conversation provides we the people a very good way to um, exercise our voice, uh, unpack some of the issues that uh, divide us, and to try and collaborat collaboratively arrive at some kind of mutually agreeable solutions. Uh, my question is, what is the next step? Where do we go from here and how? Uh, when and if uh, some solutions emerge from, this, from these kinds of conversations, how do we make sure that they bubble up and uh, effect uh, people-led and positive change in our communities, uh, in our states, and indeed the nation. So what do you do about crony capitalism? What's the next step? Well, with, with the conversation we had, I actually have dug into the issue of criminal justice this year and come to an expanding understanding that we have a, you know, very little air between us on what we think needs changing. And that's going to be really hard to make change happen because the resistance to change is tremendous. I also work on you know, work culture. Change normally doesn't happen unless there's a crisis. And we'd rather not have a crisis. But in this context, you know, this is what we need to figure out. And I don't have the answers. What I have is like this growing circle of people that care with me. And it is about trusting that together we will find a way. And I would like it to be tomorrow. <laughs> but I also have some very tortoise aspects to my personality. When something's really wrong, that persistence is crucial. I mean, good organizing is you have, have these moments of flash things happening. But it's also about being really persistent when there's something that is wrong or right that you have to do. You keep working on it until you get to where you have to go. So I would make a technology analogy. To me, it's open source. So you, what we get out of these conversations are seeds, sort of the, the core kernel of the code. You know, we've realized that the criminal justice system is broken. We realize both sides kind of see the same problems and some of the same solutions. And so our job is to then go around and plant that kernel and then let the developer community develop it into robust and mature code. And, and that's when it will start to be widely adopted in the same way that open source code is widely adopted, right? It's when you get to something that's robust, it's been contributed to by a lot of people, it's mature, 
it, it will bubble up through the system. Politicians <coughs> are inherently followers, not leaders. So they'll figure it out after we figure it out. Mm -hmm. And you got to look out when Joan gets onto an issue. Um, you know, it, it's not a trivial thing. She is pissed off about the Lewinsky scandal. Move on, eight million people. She starts care about caring about working moms and their problems. She starts Moms Rising, one million people. Right? These are not small numbers. Yeah. And my name is Walter Jonas. I live in Milton, which is the other end of the red line. Uh, what I heard you agree about most of all is the participation in politics is a good thing. And the more participation, the better. Uh, in Milton, town elections in Massachusetts are in about two weeks. In Milton, five people are running for three seats on the library board. Um, <clears throat> that's uh, very active. We don't come visit us, but we don't need you. Uh, <laughs> half a mile away, participation in elections is abysmal, abysmal. 5% of people turn out for uh, primary elections or full elections. So my question for you is since you, I presume you believe in participatory democracy, what has worked? What kind of, you can measure it very easily by counting the votes. What has worked in, in your endeavors to increase participation? You know, I don't know what it's like in your town, but I would argue that generically speaking, what works is when people believe they actually have the power to make decisions. That's not my question. My question is what has actually worked not what do you believe has worked. This is very theoretical world here, but practically. What works is when people have the power to actually make decisions. People don't participate. I, you know, I call it rational apathy. Yeah. So if people believe that getting on the library board means they're gonna go to a meeting once a month on a Wednesday night and eat donuts and accomplish nothing, most people won't run. If people believe they can actually solve problems, what I find is people like to be engaged when they feel like they're productive. So for me, what, what I've seen work, and I've seen this work especially locally, is when people are empowered to actually make change and do things, then you get real participatory governance. I'll add a piece to that, is I think it's also important to be there for people where they're at. I'll always remember one of the early emails I got with Move On was from a single mom that said, thank you. I've never done anything political before in my life. I work all day, I get home, I feed my kid, I help him with homework, I get him to bed. And that was something she could do. She could sign that petition. So, you know, some people can run for, you know, the library board, but some people can't. But I want her voice to be heard too. It's really important to find ways for as broad part of the population to participate as possible. I, I must say, neither of you have answered my question. My question was, because of what you did, did you see a change in voting participation? Oh, that's yes. a very different question. Oh, that's the question I was trying to ask. If, if I, mean, ab I mean, so on a mass scale, for sure, you saw the evidence the in 2010, <laughs> the Tea Party that's created the biggest swing between parties in Congress since 1938. So when people believe, when they're inspired and they believe they can make a difference, they come out and vote and they do make a difference. And the 2008 election was, uh, you know, another shift election because people were excited. So yes, we make a difference collectively. Uh, good, af <coughs> yeah. good afternoon, I'm Ms. Patrick Humphreys. I'm uh, with the Greater Boston Tea Party. Um, we actually last year brought in the group No Labels to speak at a rally that we had last year. It was rather an interesting experiment. Uh, we had some interesting uh, feedback from our, some of our fellow Tea Party groups. Um, I, I, it's an interesting concept, trying to find common ground. Um, you know, you sound like you're able to come up with a few areas, but Mark, you sound like you're talking about citizen solutions where things are working towards working at the individual level, which I think is what our founders really believed in and, and worked for. And I think that's part of the Tea Party message. I'm thinking that Joan, on the other hand, is thinking more along the lines that there are big government solutions that really need to happen, that the power needs to be, you know, things need to come from the top down. You see things like that in Common Core right now, something that's being heavily debated in the state of Massachusetts. Um, so I guess, you know, and you also talk about crony capitalism, which I know that we always, a lot of times people from the quote unquote left always are kind of anti-government, but I never hear any, I, I was kind of curious why I you're not- anti-corporate, right? Anti-corporate, right, okay. yeah. I mean, 
Crony capitalism is, is wrong. I hate it when it's being done by the left or by the right, by the Republicans or the Democrats. It's just wrong. And right now, I'm actually seeing quite a bit of that going on right now. It's, it's phenomenal. It seems like right. crony capitalism is off the charts right now. Um, so I guess part of my question is, why, why isn't one part of your focus on government transparency, good governance, getting corruption out of government? Because that is something that is off the charts now that I see, and I think that would be something that people could agree upon and work for. It, it seems like it's rampant at all levels. Um, and as far as conversations going, as a Tea Party person, I'm feeling being closed out of a lot of conversations. Um, you know, we're called racist, sexist, bigots, homophobes. You know, you can almost re you know, recite what we're supposed to right. be. And the message of that is really shut up, go away. And I think that really dissolves the political discord that's going on in this country. So first of all, thank you for making me not be the only Tea Party in the room at Harvard. This might be a first for me. I appreciate it. Uh, and thanks for being involved in the movement. Uh, I want to address the last thing you said first, because I think this is really important. You and I have talked about this. Um, I can't even, I couldn't in an appropriate public forum say the things that I am called constantly on the internet and television and the radio. I mean, just abusive horrible stuff. People have volunteered to euthanize my children because of my political beliefs. And so having now been a target of that, threatened with death, et cetera, it gives you a whole new sensitivity for political dialogue and what this hateful rhetoric turns into. It hasn't made me uncomfortable to talk. It makes me want to talk more. But it's also made me want to reach across the aisle more and to let people know, look, you know, I'm not going to let you objectify me because I'm a human being. And I have an 18-year-old son who's enrolling in the Marines, and I have a 15-year-old daughter who's a high school freshman. That humanity is the most important thing that we can give to each other. The idea that these are not your enemies. These are not people you should hate. These are not people you should objectify and vilify. Now, Joan and I have become good friends. She's a great mom. I know about her kids. I know she plays soccer. How do you hate somebody like that? You can't and you shouldn't. If I just say she's the founder of moveon.org and I disagree with them politically, it's really easy to say, oh, she's a bad person. Joan's not a bad person. We disagree on politics and we have to learn as a society to separate our disagreement on politics from our belief about other people as human beings. So that's just the first issue. On the transparency issue, look, I think, yeah, it's a given we're all fans of transparency, right? And I think everybody, all of us citizens, when I say all, I'm talking about citizens, not people in power, in governing power, right? So citizens, and by the way, that's a left-right issue. The left doesn't really, in, in power doesn't like transparency, nor does the right. And I can give you numerous examples. The biggest problem with transparency is we can get transparency and then we've got no levers to do anything about it. We've got no real power. We see corruption, we see bad things, and then the same people get elected over and over, the same things go on, nobody pays a price. So I think the problem is, where's the lever of power that lets us do something about the corruption we see when things are transparent? And I just want to add to that. I mean, this panel, the reason I'm here, is much less about the issues and much more about the relationship. I and mean, it pains me that you've experienced that kind of you know, response and that you have too. It's, you know, it's to say that we really need to have those relationships before we can start hearing each other the way we want to. And there are lots of things we disagree about. And living room conversations are only one in a really broad toolbox of opportunities to then go on and start to have, you know, solutions put into the mix. But it's going to start with really appreciating our, you know, that you're a kind and caring human being that is intelligent, and I could have a good conversation with you. So uh, we're almost at our closing. I, this is a university, so I wanted to uh, convey a couple of, of reading suggestions. One, Joan pointed out to me a, a really interesting book by Parker Palmer called Healing the Heart of Democracy, which is about democracy at this level, person to person and listening. And I think probably almost all of the courses that are at the university and all of the lectures are not about democracy at this level. They're about 
institutions. They're about Congress or maybe how organizations like Move On and the Tea Party are put together and how they advocate, but they're not about this. And this is extremely an extremely important level. Um, a few years ago, I was reading a, a book by a, a Chinese uh, activist, a political thinker and scholar called uh, uh, Yu Qiping, and he, was, he wrote a very controversial essay called Democracy is a Good Thing about China. And he said that, well, you know, there's a lot of obstacles in China to getting to democracy, but one of them is that we, the Chinese, have forgotten how to have a meeting. And by that, I guess he meant kind of a Tocquevillian meeting where people figure out how to put together a library or run a school or settle a zoning dispute or whatever it is. And um, you know, this conversation is extremely moving because uh, in America, maybe one of our obstacles to the democracy is we've forgotten how to talk to each other on this human level about public things that we care about. And, and so you have to have an organization to figure out how to have living room conversations, right? And that's kind of a, a tragedy that we've gotten to that place, but it's extremely hopeful that people as kind of gifted and capable as you are trying to help us out with that problem. So thank you very much. Thank you. I, ha I have a request. So we're here at an institution that can arguably is the heart of influence in America. So people go to school here and about leading the great American institutions. These are the people that will change the culture of America. If they go out and they take these ideas, this kind of philosophy into the institutions with them and remember this type of conversation, how important this kind of dialogue is over time, that changes the fabric. It's important that average folks like me in small cities and towns across the country do it, but there will be much less resistance, resistance to this kind of dialogue if people who have this kind of influence go out into society and insert this attitude into the institutions. So please, you guys, it's up to you. We'll go forth and do that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.